so nobody has to listen to us with the small talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, it's showing recording, right, Petro? Yep, you're good. Okay. All right. Are we starting? Let me unshare this, and the floor is yours, Sophia. Oh, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Sophia. I'm the events administrator with the Boca Chamber. Uh, thank you, everyone, for logging in. I know it's nice to probably do this from the comfort of your own home. Um, we're going to talk about effective website content today with Petro and Alex. I think between the both of them individually, you guys have over like 15 years of experience in marketing and tech. Um, so I'm just going to give the floor to you guys. All right. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Uh, let me show the screen here. All right. There you go. That's us. Um, well, do you want to introduce yourself, Petro? Sure. Yeah, I'm Petro. Uh, I am the Chief Growth Officer at Predict, uh, and we are a fractional CMO service. And um, like Sophia says, we have a Lots of experience, but you know, spread out through marketing, sales, uh, technology, uh, and really just helping companies grow and better understand um, how to relate, uh, market themselves, sell better, build their customer service, et cetera. So um, any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, and I'm Alex Oliveira. I'm the CEO of Predict. And uh, we've been with the Chamber for about six years, and I've been on the tech committee with a few people who are on the call, like Ann, uh, who's a professor at FAU. And uh, the team there, like Sophia and Sarah and all the other uh, people who put this together. Uh, we put it together about four times a year. And uh, so look out for the next one. Uh, hopefully that one will be in person. It's a lot more exciting that way, but let's make the most of it today. So with that being said, before we begin, we just want to ask the, the group here. We've got about 18, 19 people logged in now, 19. Um, and we just want to start with a question, which is, what is your biggest marketing challenge today? And I just put up a few options because it gets people thinking. And these may not be your challenges. You might have other challenges. And then what we'd like to do is at the end, once we go through the presentation, um, then kind of touch on it. And if anybody has any questions, then we'll, we'll tackle that. But hopefully, um, as far as like skills and things like that, hopefully we'll be able to present some of that information uh, today to help you um, um, increase your marketing ROI, okay? So before we begin talking about content, we wanna talk about your prep list. And like everyone through this crisis, being very prepared, that's why we chose the picture, to show that, that you really have to be prepared. Before you tackle your content on your website, whether it's social media or email, or any other distribution channel for marketing, you really have to find out what needs to be prepared. And in this conversation, it's your website, okay? So I'll turn it over to uh, Petro. Perfect, yeah. I think the, the thing that ties into with preparation um, uh, is time, right? There, it, there's not much you can do about the time part in preparation. You really do have to put some time in the beginning to set the groundwork. Like anything you, know, you do that's big and important, uh, you tend to have to set some time in the beginning to build a foundation, uh, to better understand all the details of what you're doing. Even when you're you're fully engrossed in your business and understanding it, uh, we want to start with the digital side, right? So we start with the site audit. There's lots of tools out there. We'll share some of those at the end and even give you guys an opportunity to look at your own site. Um, but the key part is, let's first say, what more importantly are the browsers, right? What are they saying about my site? Right, and that's what we do. We start with a site audit. Okay. Next. Perfect. Right, and so then the next part is once we have a site audit, we want to start examining what our brand looks like, right? And we start with colors, um, and the colors are super important to understand what they signify, really subconsciously and consciously for your customer, your consumer. Um, understanding those things this is a great simple guide that kind of goes through the colors, gives you some really good brand. Uh, examples um, and we can see as we go through that there are some of these that are just so iconic they tie back in with the colors and what they do right so understanding how the colors can affect um, your consumer uh, what the visually and what subconsciously they look at I mean there's a reason why Google and NBC use all the colors right they, they really want to feel like they cover the entire 
uh, strength things um, versus someone like a, a Dell or an HP who's supposed to be dependable and strength, right? right. Coca-Cola with excitement, Nickelodeon friendly, right? So these are some iconic brands that are really tying those things in. Once we, just, once we get through our brand and we do a digital audit, we want to really understand what content management system we're using, right? And so, um, you know, if we're building a new site, it's obviously pretty simple. You can go in and choose one. You know, these are just a few of the examples that are out there. Squarespace, Wix, and WordPress, um, and even places like GoDaddy now have their own kind of built-in uh, website builder. Um, a lot of this uh, hosting areas like GoDaddy also have access in a simple way of hosting a WordPress site. So you can use WordPress through your hosting uh, platform. So a content management system, to be clear, is, is what is how, where, where you are creating um, your website. Uh, what, what it can do, does it align with what you're asking to do, etc. You, you got it, Alex. And then when you go to hosting, Right, that's this is where your height, your your site is actually being saved. Right, well, who's hosting it? In that, who controls the speed of your website? Who controls how people are seeing it? Um, it's important that you have a really good host that ties back into the value of what you need. You know, if you're someone who who may not get thousands and thousands of hit a week, um, you can find a host that's dependable. Um, but if you need someone who deals with, you know. If you're getting 10,000 hits a week of, of visitors, you want to make sure that your host can handle that kind of traffic and speed. And most importantly, you want someone who is available, right? It's really good and important to have someone that's going to respond. They have good customer service. When you do have initial issues, uh, they do backups, et cetera, just so they're there for the worst case scenario. Perfect. Once we choose, <clears throat> Our content management system, we know where we're hosting. You know, the next big step is, is finding a good theme. Um, there's lots of different markets uh, that you can look at here, right? Creative Market, there's Envato um, that's out there um, that allow you to search, right, for free. You can go through and search the market and find, you know, one that you really like. Um, there's lots of little key things we would say to look for in a theme besides what it looks like. You want to find a theme that's been updated recently. You want to find a theme that shows that there's going to be updates going forward, right? Those are all little pieces of information they'll put in bullet points when you're looking at the theme. Um, and ratings, right? They'll be rated. Find out a, a good developer because in the end, your theme needs to be updated, whether you do it or not, um, in the back end uh, for security reasons, as things change, if you're going to invest the time and effort into building a website on a theme, you want to make sure that the person who developed it's also putting uh, some of that effort into keeping it up uh, and working on there. But the good part is, you know, as you can see on Envato, there's almost 50,000 themes out there. So you got lots of choices. Go ahead. Um, you know, oh, go ahead. And, and then on your website here, you have um, some key little pieces that we always kind of look at. We call these the key nuggets. When we look at someone's website in the beginning, if we're doing a quick visual audit. Um, and then, and some of these are things that are quite simple. Do you have a form on your website and does it work, right? What I mean by does it work is if you fill that information, and you ask someone to do something and then they're going to get something in response. Does it actually do that, right? Does it send them a PDF? Does it download them something? Maybe does it send them an email thanking them for the information? Whatever it is your form is going to do. T and C are terms and conditions. You want to make sure you have your terms and conditions on your website. Your website, you know, is a, is a marketplace. You own it. You are responsible for what's on it. Um, and so legally, you want to make sure you have your terms and conditions on there. Specifically, if you're selling something or you're asking for information like an email or a phone number, um, there's lots of rules and regulations around that. So you want to make sure you have your terms and conditions up there. A privacy policy also falls in that same realm. You want to make sure you have all that on there so people understand what you're doing with their data. Um, the key part about the data is understanding that when you ask for someone's data or your website is collecting data um, you know, passively, you also, that privacy policy is super important to protect you, right? It's required in, obviously, in all European countries under GDPR, which comes up next, CCPA in California, same thing. You want to make sure you have all the, 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 the normal regulations. You can find those things online, right? You can find samples online. You can get them to fit for yourself. Um, you can hire a lawyer or use something like LegalZoom uh, to make sure that your document legally covers yourself. But it is super important. We can't tell you how many websites we go on um, daily that do not have terms and conditions and privacy policies. So just um, 
super important to do that. Uh, and then the fifth bullet there talks about ADA compliance, right? Um, something um, that's semi new on, on the web, but has been growing in importance uh, and in notoriety, I would say. Um, when you're having users use your website for any number of reasons, you want to try to use something that's an ADA compliant. They have plugins, there's add-ons that you can add to your website. Uh, visually here, you can see um, one of the ADA compliance in blue, what that would look like for your website. And really what it does better for everyone to understand is that it allows systems that are already in place for people who need it, right? So if you have someone who could be a consumer who is, who is blind, and or deaf, they'll have uh, something on their computer that allows them to either hear, visually read the entire site, um, or uh, allows them to see it in different ways, right? Maybe they need it to be bigger, different colors, etc. An ADA compliant plugin allows your website to be readable and usable by that software and or system. Um, and so there's some really good systems out there. If you guys have any questions about that, you can contact us. We have some contacts in that area um, that can help you guys uh, with getting your website up and going. And I can tell you that a very simple plugin um, will, can be attached to your website and be up and running in less than 24 hours. So it's something that can be done quite simply um, and quite affordably. Uh, the last two things are super important for the your browsers, right? So what you're thinking about with what's important as you build a website is how do people find you, right? And they find you through browsers, Google and Bing and um, DuckDuckGo, et cetera, all the, the different browsers out there. And how those browsers uh, rate your site, uh, better organize your site and allow it to be searchable are the last two items really. A site map, right, which tells everybody from the coding perspective, what's on your site, right? How do they search it? What's the hierarchy? How does that work? You want to make sure you have a, a searchable site map. Um, and to be clear, searchable is very important. There are some, you can create a site map that's not searchable by a browser. So you want to make sure that that's done correctly. On that end, and then a search tool. What does a search tool do? It allows anyone to search things on your website by typing in um, quickly on there. So when you have a search bar at the top, um, we find nowadays uh, consumers are more and more using that rather than searching through all your menus. So they're finding exactly what they need through a search to another just key addition to what we say when you're building a website. Perfect. So one of the things we talk about when we're selling something or we want people to contact us is your phone number, right? Where is your phone number on your website, right? The number one thing we would say is do not hide it in your footer. Your footer is the bottom of your website. Put it at the top of your website as a header, um, preferably somewhere on the left side. Um, you can see here available 24-7 at 1-800-927, et cetera, et cetera. Phone number's right on top for customer service. In this case, Zappos, you can actually click that little arrow there and it'll actually show you all the phone numbers that you would need depending on the area you're looking for. So um, having your phone number somewhere on the top, if that's a way that you want consumers to contact you, should be up there. Any other way you want them to contact you should also be up um, right on the top there. All right. So we're going to get into the content strategy piece of this now. Now that you've kind of got your prep list for your website, um, we're going to talk about distribution channels um, briefly here. And basically, there are four distribution channels online, um, and you can categorize it in this way. So we're going to be really touching on your content as it pertains to the owned media. That's owned media, things that you can control, like your website, your blog, your email, and video. Now, of course, you're going to distribute them on other platforms that you don't control, like search engines that change the algorithm constantly. But what we do know is that when you drive traffic to your website, you control everything, the, the, the customer journey, what they see, how they see it, how they experience it. So that's why we are a fan as marketers um, of working on your own media first, because that's not something that you lose. As you add more content to the website, it's always going to be there. Okay. So uh, distribution channels. All right. So content, and we're going to go through a lot of different types of content that Petro is going to touch on, but I'll just start with the more informational type of content versus, versus thinking about it as something that's purpose-driven, useful for your user, right? 
Um, you know, when you think of a typical website, you've got blog posts, you've got images, videos, newsletters that you can view, and maybe even some social media feeds that they're pulling in from their uh, social media profiles. And that's good. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming that many people do their keyword research, which we're going to touch on later. And then they kind of create the content that they think they think that their users want. What we're suggesting is that you kind of go over here to the right. And instead of just looking at the informational, you look at the purposeful and, and the what they call selfish content versus empathetic content, right? So thinking about what the user wants and there's an easy way to do that. And that's just by asking your, your customers, asking the people that come to your website, what is it that they want? Do they want a podcast? Do they want to see reviews, which is a great trust factor to have on your website? Okay. List of resources, links, or do they just want to see everything about your company? Now, most of us don't want to see all of this and it's great for you to, you know, for your brand to put out press releases and, you know, company timeline and all those things. But at the end of the day, you got to find a happy medium between the information and the content that's actually impactful. So this webinar would be that type of content, right? Web, webinar or webcast. So the chamber what? is, is, putting together this webcast today for its members. That's what I would consider empathetic content because in the tech committee over the past four years since um, I've sat on that committee with, with Anne and Sarah, Sophia, and many others, I don't know if Mike or Eric are on the call right now, but um, you know, we kind of go through what the members, the chamber members are asking for when it comes to content. And we know the chamber puts on a lot of different um, workshops, both in person and online. And how they go about doing that is really asking their, you know, 14, 1500 members. I don't remember the last count of number of members, but it's a large group. And they're asking, what is it that you want? Do you want a, us to put content um, up about HR? Is it about finance? Is it about marketing, sales? Um, so they are listening to their members before they're putting together the content. And in this case, with the tech committee, we always try to find a happy medium between marketing and technology, which impacts people's business, their, their, their sales. So um, definitely take a look at the content that you have on your website, talk to your customers and find out is what's on the website what they want. And there's another way of doing that, which we're going to touch on as well, which is looking at your analytics primarily Google Analytics, right? So if you, you put up a blog and at the end of the year, it's been up for a year and only 10 people have engaged with it, then you probably know that it's not very useful. And sometimes it's not because people couldn't find it. It's just, it's not interesting enough, right? All right, so let's go on to the next uh, customer journey here. So for customer journey, there's a couple of things that you can do. Petro was talking about on your website, Looking at the form, the form is so important for any organization, B2B, B2C, whether you produce, you, you, you offer a product or a service, it's really important that you map out that customer journey on your website for content um, and make sure that the questions that you're asking on the form are the, the, the questions that, that that target audience needs to answer, right? And then making sure that you, you, from time to time, test the forms. So after this call today, get on your website and submit a form. Do the same for social media. If you have a marketing team or a freelance or an agency that's handling your marketing, do it every month. Submit questions on your website, right? As like a, uh, just a secret shopper, right? So you can use a, your personal email and reach out and see the speed to contact. Do the same for social media. Send a message. Um, do the same for the phone call. Call the, the, your office and find out how people answer. And, and you'll start to map out what that customer journey looks like. Um, and then here are some other tools that Petro is going to talk to you about to make that customer journey much better within that marketing funnel. Yeah, and I think the, the key part about when we're talking about forms and what it looks like, right? a form, just to be clear, right, is really something that um, is on your site that allows someone who visits it to fill it out, right? It can fill out for, for multiple reasons. It could be because they want more information or you would like them 
to give you your information so you can send them a newsletter um, or to send them a piece of information that's on your website that's important that you want them to download, right? And those things are used from our end as business owners um, to better understand who your audience is, right? So you have a form on your website, maybe you have a piece of, of writing, a white paper, um, some sort of PDF that you created that you have on there and that the form allows them to download it, right? Get access to it and then maybe be part of your newsletter email every week or maybe it's just a phone number. Whatever it is the form is being used for, um, that's what we're talking about. And what, you know, after we understand what that looks like, right, there are some tools on there that help us with that. Right now we have up on the screen Hotjar. Hotjar is a, is a plugin, software plugin, uh, that allows you to really map out the journey on the physical website. What I mean by that is it actually records and follows someone's mouse as they journey through your website, where they click, where they go, how long they stay. Uh, and both will take a video recording and show you what they call a heat map, right? So a heat map will show over time, where do people click, right? So a lot of the times we'll create a website, we'll design it based on hopefully some good information and analytics, but not realizing that maybe there's a certain button that gets clicked more than others or that button that you think everyone's gonna go here. They're gonna go, this is where we created it but not everyone goes there, right? So Hotjar will allow us to take some of that subjective information and make sure it's fully objective, right? It has the data behind it. Um, and that's something very simple you can put on your website that tracks um, everyone's journey within your website. Um, uh, SurveyMonkey uh, is one of those tools out there that allows you to create a survey, um, right? And so when you're thinking about a survey, uh, there's other services out there that also create forms. Um, and or service that you can use. But again, another way to better interact with your clients for them to be there, better understand what information they want from you, right? Um, what information they need. Um, if you're trying to create a new product, another good tool is to use a survey to better understand how a consumer would buy it, use it, interact with it, et cetera. And then a live chat, online chat, um, chat bot is what they call them now, right? What or do you have a chat bot on your website? Um, it's super important nowadays, right? We find that the use cases within a chatbot are growing uh, month to month. As we look at the statistics, more and more people are using chatbots as they interact on your website. There's lots of different versions and ways you can use a chatbot. A chatbot could simply uh, answer questions that uh, are pre-filled in answers, right? So you could have some frequently answered, asked questions um, that you have pre-determined uh, and pre-saved and based on that information, someone could type something in. You can have a live chat that either you or a third party is answering questions or sending people in the right direction uh, within your website. Um, however you look at it, uh, also a key part of, of a website uh, nowadays. And then Petro, also with the chat, get, get, you know, the chat bot is one way, but for you guys that you have um, customers, people that come to your website because they're looking for customer service, a, a great way to use chat is to actually have real call center live people answering those chats. So give them an example of some of our clients, like the clients that are using like Apex, how that works yeah. and how they get charged just per lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're using it as, well, twofold, right? You're using it as customer service and you're also using it as a lead funnel, right? So as people are coming on your site looking for information, they may come on the chat and say, hey, I have this uh, specific, um, item I need, as they go through that, the chat service actually automatically transfers them if they have a phone number or sends an email uh, with a lead uh, to the client themselves and says, hey, this person is looking for information specifically about this. You guys actually get to create that journey based on how you would like that information to come in. Um, and then what you do is follow it afterwards, right? So the chat service just asks, say, hey, we, we sent you this lead, how did this end up? Um, and the chat services for the most part charge based on that lead actually becoming a consumer, right? So as long as they come on, they sign a contract or they buy a product, what they do, um, you don't actually get charged until the person actually buys something. So for our business perspective, that's great, right? You get to not have to deal with some of the risk as far as buying a lead. Um, this is based on your website. They came to your website and the chat service just helps them along. We call it a customer funnel. Um, and allows them to get to the lead perspective. And I think the key part of all of this is that in a lot of cases you only have to invest once they buy something from you. 
Right. And the next one that we're going to tackle for your content is your landing pages. So typically everyone is aware that their homepage, they think of it as a landing page. That's where people, your users typically go to the homepage. Um, but the thing that we always talk about when it comes to leads itself, leads are sales. So if you're e-commerce, you want to, you want to convert clicks into sales. Um, if you're a service business and you're not selling anything on your website, then you want to convert those into leads. In order for you to do that successfully, you have to have landing pages. And then you can see the example here. There's an anatomy to a landing page. Always the form works better. There's tons of studies to show that the forms work better on the right-hand side. Um, you want to have your logo here, typically a phone number up here, a, a, a headline, an image, uh, preferably an image that has people in it interacting with your product or service. And then you have a little blurb, maybe a sentence with 100, 200 words to explain um, what it is that they get. A couple of bullets, three, four bullets maybe to explain uh, the benefits or features about your product or service, right? And then here in this case, above the fold without me having to scroll, I'm seeing companies that let's say this company has done business with, which is a trust factor. Um, and then most importantly, your call to action, your call to action, and then deciding what fields you're going to collect. Again, at bare minimum, the fields that you always want to collect on a form, a landing page, or your contact page on your website is first name, last name, the company, the email, and phone number, bare minimum. In this case, there, th this company is asking what company size is this? right? And if the company might be too small or something like that, it'll just tell them we don't serve your, your audience. So they're not even going to be able to download the copy. Um, but that's it. And once somebody clicks that, uh, the get my copy on the landing page or submit or get a quote, whatever your call to action is on the button, then you also have to think about what happens on that landing page after. You don't want simply for people to see a little blurb here that says, thank you for submitting your request. You want them to be redirected to another page that actually, you know, tells them what to do next, right? If, if it's check your email, you're going to get the downloaded copy now. Um, so it's very important to build landing pages and let you should have a landing page for every product and service, every different line of product. So if you're an e-commerce company and you have a thousand products, you should have a thousand landing pages and the landing pages are a little bit different than just a full uh, website where you see all the buttons here. Landing page is like a flyer. You want people to focus on one thing and do one thing only, not be clicking around and get lost. Okay. So keyword research, there are a lot of tools out there for keyword research. You're not going to start to create content or you shouldn't if you don't know your keyword list. So important, so important for you to understand what users are searching online on Google, on Bing, uh, uh, Yahoo, uh, and all the different search engines. What are they searching for? You need to find out what those keywords are, whether it's just a short keyword or a long tail keyword. Um, and there are plenty of free tools that you can use here. Uh, our favorite tool really is SEMrush. Uh, and we're going to give you a, a link to that later so that you can run a website audit at no cost. So we've, we've made an, an arrangement with them for chamber members so that you guys can get a free website audit. And from there, you can do some keyword um, analysis. Also, Keyword Planner on Google is a free tool, uh, except that you have to sign up for Google Ads. Um, you have to put in your credit card. You don't have to spend any money on an account, uh, a campaign. But then you can actually search for how many people are looking for, let's say your business is bookkeeping. And it said, bookkeeping near me, bookkeeper in Boca, best bookkeeper in South Florida, whatever that keyword combination is, you want to know how many people are looking for it and what the competitive uh, uh, level is and then also the cost per click. So keyword is very important. Don't write anything or create any content on social media for your website, for your email until you know and, and or have your keyword list ready. Okay. Um, the next thing about keywords is that will lead you into better search engine optimization. Everyone always hears for the last 20 years about SEO, search engine optimization, which is just basically the visibility of your website on search engines. 
Um, this graph here is made by Moz. It was back in 2019, last year, August. And Moz is, is they're, they're one of the top companies that works to demystify that the algorithm, right? Google has over 250 algorithms that they're changing thousands of times per year. So you can see here, you know, mobile friendliness, like very important, right? The speed of the website. Number one, the most important thing is rele relevance of overall page content. That is super important. So if you title your page, um, you know, let's say 10 things you must know uh, before hiring a bookkeeper. Uh, and I get to that page and there's really not much talking about that and it's very thin, the content, you're not gonna rank for that. Now there's a lot of other elements to SEO and we have the link for you guys down here. Um, it's from a company called Backlinko and he, he mapped out uh, the 200 algorithms that you need to focus on. Probably one of the biggest ones, and Petro can touch on this um, when we get to that section, is the load speed. So many websites are so slow, and that really affects the user experience and how you rank on search engines. I'm giving you guys an example here of reviews. Locally there, and also a chamber member is the, the YMCA of South Palm Beach County. They do a phenomenal job with reviews and testimonials, so they use a tool called Listen360. Okay, and what Listen360 does, there are other tools like BirdEye that, that sort of do the same thing, is they collect all your reviews from everywhere, okay? Um, so that's, a, that's another tool that you can use and reviews become very important for you when it comes to content, all right? Before we, before we jump into that really quickly, I wanted to ask us if anyone had any, other, any questions thus far, right? So you could either type them in the chat um, or ask us directly, but if you have any questions as you're coming through, please, as even as we're talking, you know, we don't mind, please just put them in the chat um, and we'll get to them as we see them. Um, but if anything comes up along the way, feel free to ask. Great. So yeah, so, so back to the reviews, it, it's really about customer service and listening to what your, your, um, your customers are saying. Um, and I, I think you're going to jump into this section, right, Petro? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fine, perfect. So, uh, you know, one of the things that came up and I saw a couple of people typed in the chat uh, that in the beginning we talked about what are the things that are holding us back, right? The, about time and pairing and time tends to be the one, right? And so one of the things that you can do is instead of having to create all this content on your own uh, is to find a good content solution provider, right? And so we've worked with all of these before, uh, Text Broker, Upwork, Canva, Design Pickle, right? And they all have kind of different little niches that they tie into. Text Broker uh, is really about finding a good content writer, right? A technical SEO writer who will be able to really uh, build something out for you that is both um, what we'd call empathetic, right? So it ties in with what your, your client is looking for, but also have the technical um, aspects of writing online, right? Which adds in things like keyword and SEO research, et cetera. Uh, ties in there um, you know canva is a great tool to create digital graphic design images um, and, and really build things out that way it's something that's it's pretty simple and that most most of us after a little bit of time can get used to kind of messing with it and there's some good templates on there that you could use uh, design pickle is a, one of those great you know, graphic design services you you go on there you apply you explain to someone you explain actually create an application you explain what is it you're looking for um, what are the needs you're having? What's about your business, et cetera. You put it out there and you'll get back uh, actually pitches, right? And they'll kind of start designing out what you're asking them to do. Upwork, similarly, you can find um, technical people, graphic designers um, who can help you do the job that you're needing to do. Um, and Wave is a great, simple uh, making a video in a few minutes. There's a bunch of those apps out there. Again, we're just trying to make, help you understand that sometimes when time is a factor, we say, oh, we don't have time to do that. Um, but there are some great solutions that will help you uh, cut that time and effort down. Um, you know, here's a nice uh, a visual of, of kind of what the areas um, on your website are. Um, and again, you'll have this so you can go back and through it so you can also reference it if you're not familiar with some of these terms. When you are talking to someone on an Upwork or on a Design Pickle who's a little more technical, you can kind of use these terms to better understand what are the areas on our website. Um, as far as a headline, a header, an intro, uh, main copy, your social media icon. So this next section, uh, and we won't go in, in um, 
much detail into the blog uh, game plan, but why, why would a blog be important, Petro? Yeah, no, I think the blog's important for, for multiple reasons, right? Including um, getting content on your website, right? So when you're talking about um, what it is you're getting out there on your website, a blog is a great way to get that content number out there. So the, so the search engines really start to recognize that you have the information and you have the expertise in the area in which you are selling. Um, and then it also allows you to get your, your message across, right, to your consumer, right? And so them better understand who you are as an organization, what your technical abilities are, the specific things they're looking for. Um, you can be out there to send some information. You'll see out there right now, a lot of people are writing blogs specifically about, okay, how are we gonna work at home better? Uh, you have kids at home right now. People are writing blogs about uh, how to homeschool or how to you know deal with all the things we're dealing with right now. So there's sometimes the blogs are even just about current events. Currently what's happening, how we can talk out there, a great way to share information. Can you touch on a little bit, Petro, and we're talking about here like target audience before you write your blog. Typically blogs between 500 and 1,000 words are favorable for the search engines. And you start to look at your target audience, you do your keyword, keyword research, and now you're like, okay, I know what I'm gonna write about. But can you touch on sort of like some of the issues that we've seen with clients where they might write about a blog and that blog may get, you know, 50,000 clicks a year, but get them zero leads. Why, why, yeah. why would that be maybe? Yeah, no, there's a couple of reasons you can see that, right? The, I think the number one reason that you see it sometimes is you have what we call keyword crossover, right? So you'll have a, a word specifically um, that actually is gaining a lot of interest um, on search engines, but that doesn't have to do with your actual content, right? So sometimes it's, uh, you know, a term that you may use technically speaking, but it does not tie in, it ties into another term that maybe is getting more research, right? So uh, sometimes there's a medical drug that's out there. There's a lot of medical drugs out there that have lots of different names in them. Um, it may not have to do with what you're looking for, but because that word that you're using is being used elsewhere and someone's paying a lot of money for it, it's a Google uh, ad, et cetera. Um, so that way that doesn't tie in as well. Uh, the other reasons, are you can and the reason and how you can really stop that is using things called negative keywords, right? And again, that's a little bit technical, but the idea is that you can also stop keywords from allowing people to see your site. So even though you're getting 50,000 visitors, and this is something we talk about with clients all the time, um, if you're not getting a return on those visitors, having those visitors mean very little. Um, and in fact, they can you know create um, lots of issues with the website going forward if it's not really bringing you uh, positive uh, information. Um, you know, this game plan here is a nice way of understanding how to go through it, um, right? Obviously, the working title, understand what that is, um, how are we going to grab the reader's attention, what is that piece of information, making sure that it's not just grabbing their attention, but ties back in with what you're going to talk about, that it's relevant, um, lots of technical things as far as tags and meta descriptions um, that can be, you know, we we'll try to explain a little bit of them on here, but these are important for the browsers again. You want people to find your blog, right? So Alex mentioned in the beginning, sometimes you write a blog, a year later, 10 people have engaged with it. Um, the first problem can be that no one found it, right? It can be that no one has actually read it, so no one's seen it, it's not out there properly, there's an issue with that, so you wanna make sure first and foremost that you're doing that properly. Um, and then secondly, that the obviously the content itself um, is engaging and people want to read it. And, and once you've done all that, the other piece of it is really trying to find links, you know, linking to other sites that are kind of relevant to your industry. And you go to their webmaster and you say, hey, I'd like to build some links here. I will point my, you know, part of my content to your website, like within a, a specific keyword, um, you would hyperlink that keyword. That's called link building. And then they would do the same so that you could get a reciprocal link. And if you talk to any digital marketer who's doing search engine optimization, they will often talk about the off-page SEO. There's on-page and there's off-page. On-page, you control everything. That's all the technical stuff. Um, but off-page is what happens out of your website. So link building would be one of those key important ones. And, and, and for the search engine, it, it is a very important algorithm. So you wanna make sure that you're linking to other sites um, and when you do your audit, you'll find out how many links you have coming into your website. Um, another uh, aspect of links is making sure that you don't have toxic links coming into your content, right? And you'll find that out about that uh, on your audit as well. 
Can you, um, can you give, can, Alex, can you give a quick example of what a good link would look like, what that would really mean, like in real, for maybe for one of our client links? Oh, great. Yeah. I mean, an example would be like, well, first of all, before you do the link, you have to determine if the website um, isn't a website that has a low, what they call domain authority, that they don't have a low domain authority. And you could do that for free. So let's say Petro comes to me and says, hey, listen, I know this guy that owns this website. Uh, in the construction industry. Let's say I was a, a kitchen and bathroom modeling company and I was writing a blog about top nine things to consider before doing your kitchen remodel. Um, and then Petra says, oh, hey, I know this company that uh, distributes this product and they would link back to us. My next step would be to go on Moz, M-O-Z, Moz.com and look for what's called the domain authority of that website. I would type it in and then it would give me the domain authority on a scale from zero to a hundred. If the domain authority is below 40, I'm not going to link back to that site. And the reason why that that website might have a low domain authority is because their content is thin. It doesn't really serve a purpose. And not only Google, but the other out, uh, uh, search engines see that website as not valuable to users. So it's not going to help me. It might help them, but not help me. So you just want to make sure, number one, is that the domain authority is high. Uh, number two, you want to make sure that the content within there is relevant as well and that you're not just linking to other directories that really won't do anything for you. So that, that would be an example of, a, a, you know, things to consider before linking to a website. All right. um, how about images, Petro? Talk to me about just creating stock photos, just picking out of, let's say, um, you know, um, not Photoshop, but let's say a uh, Canva even versus using Photoshop or, or something that might, might give you, uh, uh, or the user a better visual story, especially if you have, let's say you're a cupcakes, uh, or, or a restaurant cupcake, uh, you know, bakery Baker. or, or restaurant. There's so much eye candy there. And I never get why so many organizations, small or large, use stock photos to tell their yeah. story. Yeah, and no, I think the, the important thing is to think about it in, in a, from a personal perspective, right? The empathetic side of things as we talked about with your content, right? You want it to be as realistic as possible. You want people to tie back to exactly what they're going to see because you're going to be able to exude a feeling of not only what you're selling, right? If we're selling cupcakes and bakeries, how beautiful and nice your cupcakes look or your bakery looks like or the restaurant looks or the food looks, et cetera. Um, but then it also ties back to the feeling they should be getting when they come to your business or they order from your business, right? Those are the things that come out of personal images, right? And using, you know, Photoshop or Illustrator and design, you can help manage those photos, design them, making sure they tie in and they, they fit exactly what you're looking for on your website. Using a place like, you know, Canva or Envato, et cetera, they have lots of images on there that you can use. They are stock images. Um, the last part about that that I will tell you is that Please don't use website uh, images that you just find off Google. Mm. Uh, you want to make sure you own the rights to the images that you're putting on your website. Don't just copy and paste of other things. Um, so when you do purchase an image or you get an image off of a, a stock photo company like Canva or any of the other ones out there, you actually get to use that. You have the right to use that image. You'll actually get a little document with it when you download that image to show that you actually own the right to that. And over the years, I can tell you, we've had, I've talked to, uh, with Ann about this in the past. We've had many clients uh, of all sizes that allowed someone, and you know, no offense to interns, but an intern to just go out on the internet and grab a picture, save it, upload it to their website. And I can tell you personally that I've dealt with those clients who came to me with a, a, a letter from law firms that all they do all day is crawl websites that do not have license to those images and they will hit you up with a $3,500 or $5,000 demand uh, in small claims court. And, and, and that's it. And you, you can either pay it, negotiate it, or, or just go see them in court. Most people just pay it. So I, again, I have clients that have literally paid thousands of dollars for an image that they didn't have the right to use. And then they still had to take it down. So there are companies that are out there just like with the ADA compliance there are law firms out there who all they do is look for people who are breaking the rules, whether it's can spam with emails, right? Emails, another thing. You don't want to just send people emails unless they opted in. Um, you really have to know what those digital 
compliance regulations are before you yeah. start to do them. But the image is important. Um, you know, for blogs or for content, talk about video a little bit, Petro, and especially like this little graphic, because it kind of tells you what <laughs> platforms you should do what. Yeah, no, I think that's also important, right? So you, you may create a video, you want to make sure your video is purposeful, not only for, again, the content side of it, but also where, where are you going to have your consumers view it, right? Is it going to be a social media video that's, you know, viewed quickly, you're on the go, um, you know, et cetera, you're trying to tie in as it's scrolling through a, a message board, et cetera. Um, or is it a video that's going to live on your website or on a YouTube channel that allows people to where they go and they tend to spend a little bit more time. They may be a little bit more engaged. They're going to want a little bit piece of information. Um, in fact, for most consumers, if you're creating a plan, a brand, uh, video or commercial, we do it in multiple time frames, right? We'll do a seven to 15 second video that may be shared on social media. It could be a quick shoot on a home page, and then you'll do a longer version of that same video uh, that may live on YouTube or on a video. Uh, a page on your website so where people will go when they do want a little bit more information um, and tie back in. This little graph on the bottom here is a great little tool to just a shortcut to understanding how are most people using these uh, areas in which to watch your videos, right? So Facebook, uh, uh, Instagram, uh, news feeds, right? Again, quick on the go on the mobile. YouTube is considered a little bit more educational, depends more time. Vimeo, same kind of a thing, right? Where people are tying in. Um, a little bit more engagement and time and investment into what you're doing on there. But the key part about video is that video is so much more engaging, right? We see all the statistics on there now. It's it's beyond reproach. We're not arguing anymore. Is it photo or video? Video is king. You want to make sure that you have video for whatever you can show that is visually appealing, um, even if it's an informational thing where it's just you talking and telling someone what it is your product is or what you're doing, um, sharing it face to face, making it personal. Um, is the way to go. You'll find your engagement goes up quite a bit in whatever platform you're really using. And, and you know, don't do it the lazy way. If you're uploading video to Twitter, hmm. Facebook, Instagram, upload the video. Don't just take the video that you uploaded to YouTube and then drop the link into there because it's not going to do a lot for you as, as, as far as the visibility of the content. But talk to, talk to uh, us, Petro, about the website, because we're back to own media, what I own, what I do on my website. Why would I want to use a video hosting platform like Vimeo and then have that video live on my website that way versus just taking the embed video, which is free from my YouTube account? Why, why would I do that? Well, there's two things you want to do, right? I think the, the number one thing is you, on your website, it is your own media. You've put the time and effort and, and money and investment, right, into getting someone to your website. And once they enter your website, you want to control that experience as much as possible. You want to understand what they're going to see. Um, and by using something like a, just a YouTube embed, what that actually does is it embeds their player, right, the YouTube player. Um, and a YouTube players have an autoplay, right? And they also can see other videos. So they could be going through your video. Uh, and depending on how it's set up, they may actually be the next video that comes up after they finish watching your video. It could be a competitor's video. It could be any other video or another video that's not relevant to them again. Right? It could even be your own video. Right? But the reality is that someone came on your website looking for one thing. You want to make sure whatever they're watching um, is relevant. Right? And so using a tool like a Vimeo Pro, um, it's a very simple subscription through Vimeo that allows you to host your video, just your video, in a player that people can simply hit play, it plays the video, it stops it and starts it over again. Um, again, allows you to get people what they're looking for because hopefully that's what they were searching for um, and allows you to control that experience. Right? What happens at the end? Is there a screenshot that comes up that has a call to action that they do? Maybe that stays up on the screen and that reminds them, hey, you watched that video, that makes sense. Give us a call, sign up this email, fill out that form. Whatever it is you're trying to get them to do that call to action after the video, um, you want them to stay within your platform and on your website. So using a tool like that. And there are other tools out there. There's some um, proprietary ones that aren't such large as Vimeo and YouTube um, <laughs> that we've tested and used before with different clients that also do some other things uh, as far as how the video is performing. But in the end, you want to control your own media, right? Alex touched on that before. Your website is yours. All these other things are shared um, and not really yours, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, those are owned by somebody else using it um, right to share your information. 
And I would, re I would recommend that um, if anyone is looking uh, to, like, to learn how to create their videos, actually one of the chamber members and they're friends of ours and also um, the owner, Jen, sits on the committee with us, uh, tech committee, um, Plum Productions. So Plum Productions in Boca, they, they create videos, right? Um, a little bit more professionally done. Obviously, they're a professional organization. So for a lot of small businesses, that might be out of their price range or budget to create videos. But what uh, the owner, uh, Jen, has done is created a series on uh, YouTube of everything you need to know on how to create your videos. I, I don't remember if the name is 101, Video 101 or something like that. But I'll definitely get the link and give it to Sophia to send it to you guys. But it really is good. I mean, if you watch uh, the episodes, she's going through step by step what to use, how to create stories, and just really good. And they're here in the community. So um, I don't see them logged on today, but uh, they are definitely a good resource when it comes to video. Um, all right. So Petro, can you touch on, so we talked about blogs, we've talked about images, we've talked about videos, having your landing page. What are some other types of uh, content that you might consider? Yeah, I think, um the next steps are, are more longer form um, content, right? Like a case study, uh, an ebook. Um, ebook can any, be anywhere between, you know, you'd say two to 10, 15 pages that allows someone to get a better, deeper understanding of what you're doing. The key part about this is you are, are trying to not only share who you are, your expertise, your information about a product or a service you may be doing. Um, but it helps you better understand if the consumer that's coming on your website or downloading, what is their intent, right? Do you want to spend time uh, with that consumer? Is it someone you should chase and go after, right? Uh, if someone's downloading an ebook ver versus just visiting your website, and filling out a form, there's a different level of intent there saying, hey, I'd like to learn a little bit more. I'm, I'm at least attempting to say I'm going to spend some more time uh, really finding out about what you're doing, your product, your service, et cetera. And an ebook um, is something that's great because it's multiple use, um, right? Uh, it has some good information on there. So you put it in a format that's readable by your search engine. So therefore, the search engine will use it as helping you with content. It can be downloadable as a PDF also. So in that way, you do that. Thank you, Jonathan. I think he just posted the Plum Productions link. Thanks, John. There you go. Um, so on the chat, if you guys don't see on the chat there, there's uh, Jen's uh, link for YouTube. So um, but back to this. Case studies are great also, right? Better understanding what you guys are doing, um, giving them some statistical information, data um, on either your product or service. Um, sometimes it, it may be just something in general about your industry, right? You're trying to get out there and show people that um, you do understand your industry, what could be working out there. Um, a better understanding of some, some of the things we've done before is helping people better understand their own industry. So as, as marketing and sales professionals, we may write an ebook on you know, website content, right? I mean, we'll probably make it pretty specific to an industry so we can show that what are specific examples of, say, the um, construction industry or, uh, you know, restaurant industry. We write an ebook on how to build a website on uh, that. So the key parts is to on giving strong people your expertise and giving them a little piece of information that you can get back. Now, all of this is great. The key part is when you're sharing it, you want to get back something, right? So this is a quid pro quo. This is a sharing of information. And for that, you, you may ask a first name, last name, and an email address, right? However you feel like you want to keep that contact and information up, ask for a phone number, et cetera. Try to keep it under five pieces of information that you're asking for in trade. Um, but either way, they're going to get that information out there. And then so the, the go podcast, go, you, you could touch on it. We're both big podcast uh, <laughs> followers. It's been growing over the last 10 years. Um, uh, I just came back from a conference in Orlando a couple of weeks ago uh, called PodFest, and um, it's just growing. Uh, to date, there are about 900,000 podcasts um, in the world, um, and really less than half of those are active. Most of them, for this type of content, do what's called pod fading. They'll do 10 episodes and then just disappear. Because people realize that like video, like blogging, like sending email newsletters, it's not easy. It takes time, right? Um, but what's really cool about podcasts, not only for new customers or your brand, 
but potentially for your current audience is to educate them, right? And then other things that you can do is transcribe that audio for website copy, which is then very useful for your search engine optimization and to get more visibility. Um, for YouTube or for Vimeo or whatever video you're going to post, if you're doing a, a podcast, you could have a static image or some images scrolling through while the audio is going. So that's considered video. So you can repurpose it not only for text copy, um, but for video as well. And so again, you know, you could, if you're not doing a show just with you talking and educating and you want to make it more entertaining, perhaps you want to interview thought leaders in your industry or, or competitors or employees or vendors. There's lots of different formats. Um, at the bottom of this uh, slide, which I know you guys are not seeing the bottom right now, but there is a link to uh, podcastinsights.com. And it gives a lot of resources on how to get started with podcasting. The cool thing about podcasts today, unlike social media, unlike every other medium out there, is that only 51% of the population is listening to podcasts. So what does that mean? There's a whole world of, of people out there that have not um, um, you know, listened to podcasts. Um, whereas like with video, there's 400 hours of videos uploaded every minute. There are tens of millions of creators, uh, influencers on Instagram. 900,000 is not that much. So anything you want to add to that, Petro? Yeah, I was just going to say that, right. I, the, the key part about it is that there's less what we call static or noise, right? That's disrupting your, your voice on podcasts versus any of these other mediums. Um, and, and then when you're thinking about it, it, I think that in the beginning when we speak to a lot of uh, clients and other people about podcasting, it can be feel a little bit daunting in the beginning. Um, I, I give like two or three words of advice are one, just get started, just start recording and see what it looks like. Um, get a very basic mic. You can do it even from your phone. Um, you can get a, a mic on your phone. You want to make sure the audio is clear. It's the number one thing you can do out there, right? So the only thing really that's super important that you may invest on if you decide to go forward is having a decent mic so that you can hear your voice super clear and people can hear it. Some of the other key statistics that I heard that for me was was really important when I first started talking about it, right? The average commute in the United States is somewhere between 27 and 28 minutes. Um, and so you're thinking like, how long should I build a podcast for? You know, they, we, we look at it now under 25 minutes, it seems to be key. Um, shorter, the better 15 to 20 minute podcasts. Um, really great information, but you're also saying that people are, are being, are able to, to listen to it on a normal commute, right? And so that's out there. I think the other part about it that was super interesting is what the statistics that's up there on the left there, 49% of podcast listening is done at home, right? So everyone for a very long time was talking about podcasts on the go. And to be honest, that's how I was listening to it for a long time was while I'm driving or running or, or doing something, I'm, I'm listening to a podcast. It could be cutting the grass outside and listening to a podcast uh, through my headphones. But the key part is that still 49% of people are listening at home, which gives you the important understanding that they could be a little bit more intent, right? In what they're doing, right? They're sitting at home, they're doing something. Um, so you could be sharing different kinds of information out there. And I, I would say always test um, how it's working and how it's going. So um, have someone else listen to you. And then the last part about podcasts is don't feel like you're by yourself, right? Most really good podcasts have guests, right? They have someone comes in who as part of the conversation, a lot of times it's a pair of people. So two or three people who are on a podcast on a regular basis who bring in a third person or a fourth person to kind of add to the conversation. Um, so make it conversational is the, is the last part about that. And, and, and you can get started for a hundred bucks because the mic that most podcasters use is this one right here, the AT 2005. This mic is, I think $89, that's all you need. And then you can download for free Audacity on your desktop, or you could use GarageBand on your, on your um, iPhone Mac. or iPad, yeah. that's it. Other than that, you're gonna have great audio and, and then it's just the planning phases. So, it, it, and another thing is that now with Apple, it's not an iTunes anymore, it's actual uh, Apple podcast. Google's involved in it, but the biggest one is Spotify. So if you are not listening to podcasts right now, what I would recommend, just like video, go to the platforms like Spotify or Apple Podcasts and look for podcasts in your industry. I guarantee you that everyone that's on this uh, webcast right now 
No matter what your product or service is, there is someone talking about it. But the cool thing is there's probably only a few, depending on what you do, right? So there's plenty of room for you to be a thought leader and, and share that content and repurpose it in a lot of different ways. So definitely look into it. It's, a, it's, it's one of those that are mediums online that are not saturated yet. Okay. How about this one, Petro? When it yeah, comes to I think, website content or content in general. Yeah, right. We, we got to understand who our consumer is, right? What, is, what are the demographics, <laughs> psychographics of them? And one of those key parts, especially we're talking here, uh, being in South Florida is, you know, alternate languages, right? Is it in Spanish, right? Uh, is it fully in Spanish? I'd want to be 100%, 1000% clear. Um, it needs to be actually translated into the other language, not just Google translated. Uh, you want to make sure that it understands the meaning of the words, not just translating um, word for word uh, what's being done there. So a huge, huge part of that, um, creating specific landing pages, creating specific videos uh, that are in um, any other language, whether it is, you know, for our cases, Creole, Spanish, or Portuguese are probably the three most important ones in South Florida, um, and understanding that when you give someone something in their language, um, the engagement's going to go up quite a bit. Frequently asked questions, right? I think this is another one of those uh, areas in which is growing in more and more importance. Um, it gives people information in a quick way. And what the cool part about frequently asked questions that we talk about, and we'll go back to that idea of that time is of the essence, is that once you create your frequently asked questions, they can be used in so many ways. We touched on the idea that you could use your frequently asked questions and answers um, for a chat service. Uh, you could use it for a frequently asked questions page on your website that's searchable. People can find that information. You can then take that information and add to your own, we call domain authority or information <laughs> by putting those questions and answers on a service like Quora or Reddit um, that's out there. And again, what we're trying to do is you're, you're trying to build your own sense of, uh, of expertise online, right? Showing that you understand the information. These are important questions that people are asking. And what do those things look like? Now, when we're creating those questions, we're doing the similar thing we were talking about the content. We want to understand what are people searching for? What are the keywords they're looking at? Um, what are the questions that are out there that are targeted? You can go on a core, you can go on a Reddit and see what are the things that are out there and start answering some of those questions yourself um, and, and being that expert. So super important as you're continuing to build your SEO, build your website, and also just a great way to add some um, value uh, for your consumer. So can you, can you ask that question, uh, Petra, while I, while I go on Google to give an example of why frequently asked questions are super important? Yeah. Yeah, well, we want to know, like, well, can, first of all, I'd like to see if someone can share their industry they're in or product service you sell. That'd be great um, on the chat, Bob. That'd be awesome. And then um, you just read it out loud to me, Petra, and I'll search it and we go, go through it. Yeah, yeah. And make sure you uh, either send it to the group um, or to everybody there. If anyone has any... Um, industry or product or service they sell. No volunteers. No volunteers. Uh, okay, no worries. I will, let's just pick one here. Yeah. Um, well, 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 we were on bookkeeping. So yeah. let's just do bookkeeping. Um, so if I were saying like, um, a question for bookkeeping is, um, mm, oh, let's, let's just, okay. So most people probably know this, but let's just say if you're new to business, maybe you're, you, you don't understand the difference. Like, um, what's the difference between a bookkeeper there? And you could see. All you the questions see, that's can't populating Alex, here. Alex, you're not sharing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> that would be uh, helpful. Uh, one second, guys. Okay. Uh, there we are. Tell me when you see it, Petro. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So I'm typing in Google, uh, what's the difference between a bookkeep? I didn't even finish it and it's already populating for me what people are asking. So you already know in your industry, if you start to do manual searches, you're going to come up with what people are searching for, even if you didn't do the, the, the technical keyword research, right? So I'm gonna look for this. What's the difference between a bookkeeper and an accountant? That is a question people ask. Here's, this is what's called a snippet. Very important, we're not gonna get into it, but it is. Now here's what people also ask. 
This is where you find frequently asked questions on the search engines. And every time I, every time I click on the last one, new ones will populate, right? See that? More, more questions populating. You see that? Can a bookkeeper do tax returns? And the more I do that, and then I can come back and undo it, right? I can undo all of them. And let's say I was in my industry, I were trying to come up with top 100 questions that people ask about my product or service. This is what I would do. I would come to Google or Bing and I would do that. And when I have all these questions, I would literally, I don't care what people are answering because my, you know, my idea is to have content that is unique, but I do know how to answer these questions. If I were in my industry, I would know how to answer it. And I would answer it long form, two, three, four, 500 words, answer these questions and then ask your, your technical person or website person to optimize it on your website so that people can actually find it. But you can see here, Probably if you're a bookkeeper, you would know that some of these are your competitors. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to take some of these questions and you're going to put them on Quora. You're going to put them on Google, on social media with like a nice little graphic. You're going to put them on your website. You're going to add it to like LinkedIn as a post. So there's lots of different ways that when you're doing FAQs, you are also educating um, your, your customers, like if you're sending an email newsletter, you can send here are the top three frequently asked questions this month, right? Lots of different ways that you can, um, use FAQs for sure. All right. So we're back to FAQs. So definitely use that. Um, LinkedIn Profinder. Here's one that I wanted to share with you guys. I, I, I did this last night. Um, so if you log into your LinkedIn and when you go to the little, um, the, the little menu that has like the nine little dots, you click on it and you're going to look for ProFinder. What, what LinkedIn does is they look for freelancers who don't work for companies who are available to work with you or are, are actually already registered and ProFinder does that. So in this case, I said, you know what? I don't want to mess with, let's say, text broker or Upwork or, you know, maybe some people are looking on Craigslist, but I'm going to go on ProFinder. Why? Because I can see the person's profile and look at their recommendations and things like that. So I look for copywriter. So if I look for copywriters, LinkedIn is going to tell me here, what kind of copywriter am I looking for? I would click on blog and then I'd go to step two, step three, step four, which is basically request. You get, uh, uh, you know, depending on if say you want it in a specific location or you don't care virtually, you're going to get a bunch of pe people who are professional copywriters who are gonna write to you saying, oh, okay, so you want a blog written, 500 words, this is your industry, here's why you should choose me, and here's how much I charge. Super, super simple. So there is no reason um, why you wouldn't be able to add content to your website. Now that's just copywriting. Certainly there's case studies, videos, podcasts, FAQs. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. The point is, even if you're a small business, and you do not have the time, you don't have the skill, um, you, you have to create a budget. A typical blog, just so you know, a typical blog for an, a, a kind of mid-level writer um, is somewhere around 180 to $100 for 500 words, okay? Uh, an experienced writer in your industry, but industries like law, uh, engineering, accounting, uh, legal, medical, they're going to be a little bit more. So a technical writer there for a blog of, of 500 to 750 words might cost 120 to 150 per post. But if you think about it, if you're adding a blog every week because you don't have the time or the skills and you don't want to mess with that, it's very inexpensive to do it without having to hire a full-time person. And ProFinder is just one of those ways. So, Petro, talk to us about the email, because, again, we're back to own media, what you control. Yeah. So, after we talked, you know, all the other kind of little elements that allow you to interact with your client, right, the next one is email, right? And email is a great way to share a lot of the content we've been talking about, whether it is a frequently asked question or creating a newsletter with a blog and some frequently asked questions and a video and an image, et cetera. Um, these are some really great services out there. There are a ton more. Uh, MailChimp, a constant contact. Um, are very simple ones um, and quite 
um, affordable in the way you use them. There's some more complicated ones, but the key part is that all of these at this point in time also give you some sort of integration. So whether it is with your website or if you have a CRM, so a customer relationship management software, um, it allows you to kind of tie in all that information. Most of these, if not all of them, will also tie in directly to your website, right? So if you do have a form that you ask for an email, um, as they type it in, you can actually integrate it so it sends directly to your email service, like a Constant Contact, a MailChimp, Info, Infusionsoft. It allows you to record it there so that way your list is being created live for you, right? So it's built in there. So a great way to do this, cool part about this is that these services also help you kind of keep in line, right? We talked about earlier, there are some rules and regulations as to how you do things. It's going to ask you, are people double opted in? Do they have you have permission, are you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It'll keep track for you. Again, the statistics and the analytics, are people opening it? Are people looking at it? Are they clicking on the link that you're doing? Are they doing the call to action, et cetera? So better understanding, is your content and is your email working? Um, this is one we've used, it, it changes a bit, um, but it, overall it's pretty much the same as you go through this. What's the best day to send email? You will find, out there, lots of people who tell you otherwise, different uh, different uh, industries, they may feel that there may be different times. Uh, Tuesday, the best day to email so far. Um, if you send two emails a week, choose Thursday for your second day. Uh, Wednesday wasn't the most popular, but it was, it is mentioned several times, especially Wednesday afternoon tends to be a good time um, to send emails. What we always say is one is, if you're doing it manually, meaning you're using like a MailChimp and you're sending it out, uh, test it. Find out, hey, Tuesday morning, we see to get more openings versus Wednesday or Thursday. Ch test it out over the first few times. Um, there is um, some good software out there that will automatically do that for you. Some of the email uh, providers we, we showed you earlier have some of that built in. So right. it'll test like, it for you. Like Sorry. MailChimp Petrol, you right. know how they'll use that tool. They, they will actually tell you based on your industry, Yeah. right? Travel versus like an urgent care versus whatever the service or product is, they will actually tell you, look, based on a hundred million emails for your industry, uh, Tuesday or Thursday or Friday, whatever the day is, right? Yep, exactly. And you can automate that process. It'll check that out for you. So great. Um, and then the last one, I, I perfectly segues into what we're talking about here is measuring, right? Um, Anybody have any uh, questions first though about the yeah, last section? That's we'll, a good call. we'll pause yeah. for just a minute here. And, and uh, you guys can take a sip of your coffee. I'll, I, I'm done with my coffee, so I need to refill. But um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, you know, whether it's now or at the end, start to think about everything we talked about um, because this last piece here is very important. Um, so we'll get right into it to, if there are no other questions. All right, Petro. So how do we measure all of this? How do we do it? Oh, we have a question. We do have a question, yeah. Okay. So the question, in case someone's not reading it, says, can you explain how to find your target audience between who you provide services to and also the donors needed to sustain services? Yeah, so um, if we're talking about, I mean, we're gonna assume you're talking about a, a nonprofit who obviously needs donors to survive. Um, what you're gonna actually have is, is multiple targets, right? You're gonna have multiple, um, customer profiles, right? Consumer profiles. Um, and even within those two areas, one who you're providing your service to and in your donor service and for donors, you'll probably have, again, multiple uh, customer profiles, right? And so you're gonna do that in kind of some of the multiple ways we talked about, um, but really understanding um, who's clicking where, there's lots of research out there for most industries. Uh, and then lastly, if you're already existing, it's, it's starting with, who your, who your current donors are, right? Who are they? What information do you have on them, right? You'll have, and again, in the donor world, you have the, the maybe large chunk of donors who do small donations monthly or a couple times a year or even maybe once a year, right? Their profile and target is going to be different than maybe your large chunk yearly donors, right? How do you get to them versus those, right? They're different profiles and really there are different um, target audience for you, you're going to use different platforms, you're going to use different pieces of information to target them, even different yeah. emails. Um, well, and, and you were just talking about that, Petro, and I let me share um, 
a resource here that we use for some of our clients. Um, it's called, it's, let me see if it's still the same name. Maybe give me one second here. Um, um, because I think before, like we always talk about, you know, before um, you do that, you want to definitely use a tool to create persona. Yeah. But right quickly, if, um, if you aren't uh, speaking right now, if you don't mind uh, clicking the mute button on your volume, there's some uh, loud noise in the background. I'm not sure who's giving it off, but in the bottom corner, usually on the left corner, there's a mute button for you. If you, yeah, if you mute that off, thank you. Got it. Go ahead. Um, so this tool is fairly, uh, I'm going to share it with you here in one second. Um, share. Okay. UX. This one. And yeah, and you could try this tool for free. So, you know, for the question about tools, it's, it's basically this. First, take a look at your current donors, your current customers, and then break them up into different personas, right? Jane, Jim, Bob, whatever. Uh, their age group, the demographics, where they're coming from, their income, their education level. Every demographic psychographic that you can possibly think of that you have on them, break them up. Now that you have 10, 20, 30, 40 different personas, then you can go do the research using tools like Google Analytics, um, um, Google Ads. When you're doing your keyword research, it, it actually gives you uh, ways that you can look for those audiences. So Facebook's another, um, you know, their tool for looking at the audience, I can look at right now in Boca how many people fit that criteria for each one of these personas. So whether I'm using Instagram or YouTube, the tools that they offer in there, if I know who that, who the audience is, then I can look for those numbers. And then there is this, the third part of it is that now that you've created the personas, you've done the research to know where they are. As Petro mentioned, you're going to create content, distribute it or ads, and then you're going to come back and find out that, oh, wow, some of these aren't my audiences, but these are. Why? Because they're interacting with me. So there's definitely a lot of legwork to be done when you're trying to figure out the audience, um, and especially for nonprofits, right? Um, are, can you see the screen right now, Petro? Yeah, we're good. Yep. Okay, cool. So we'll get right back into measuring then. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and so the first one we always talk about, the simplest, is Google Analytics. Um, you embed that on your website, um, and then it'll give you more information and data than 99% of people will look at. Um, but the reality is it's super, super helpful if used properly and understood um, to see where are people going on your website, what are they looking at. Um, and again, what we keep talking about now is content. Is your content tying back to what people want to see? Um, and then how does that impact your bottom line? Meaning, does it convert? Does it convert into an actual sale or a, a sign up or whatever it is uh, you would like that people come visit your, your website to do? Um, Google Analytics will help you better understand that. Um, when you're thinking about um, Google Analytics itself, it breaks everything down into kind of three areas um, and ties back into um, your audience. Right, so it tells you about who your audience is, where are they coming from, uh, what their demographics is, geographically, how are they behaving, uh, what technology they're using to access your website, right? Is it a mobile, is it a tablet, is it a desktop? Um, and it'll better understand, help you better understand that. It'll show you the flow of your website, right? Well, that's a kind of a key one that I always like to walk through with our clients is saying, well, someone lands on this specific page on your website based on how they found you, then where do they go? Do they drop off, right? Do they exit, right? That's the term you'll see on there. Or do they go to another website? Or do they get to the point in which you're saying, I need them to do this, right? Whether it is buy something or see something. Um, this is a quick overview as an example of what you'll see as, a, as an overview of your whole site. Um, this is what you see, users, sessions, how, how long people are on there, that's your average session, how many pages they go on per session. 
um, et cetera, how many page views. It gives you the breakdown between new and returning visitors. Again, all really important information. We talked about the language earlier. Should your website be fully translated? That, you know, the bottom right there shows you kind of what languages people are, are coming on your website uh, looking for uh, to help you indicate whether you should do that or not. And then the graph on the top is always that visual. Uh, it can be done day to day, week to week, month to month, and you can see a view, view of a whole year or just a month. And so again, you get to really, really customize what the information you want out of it. This is another great view, just looking at the content, right? So we were talking about content today, how you dive in further into content. It's ranking your pages on your website. How many page views you're getting, how much time on each page, how many people are, are using that page as the entrance. So meaning how are they getting to your website? Is it your home page? Is it a schedule page? Is it whatever it may be in this case? Um, what's the bounce rate, right? Are people staying on the page? Are they losing the page? Is it not loading fast enough? So we want to understand what that kind of journey is and what then we will constantly be improving it. We're constantly checking it, constantly changing and making sure that the content is, is lined up properly. The technical part is there and all those things tie in. So, and, and Pedro, uh, real quick, yeah, go. is it free to install Google analytics? Yes. And just a quick, how do you do it? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, Google Analytics is free. There's actually a whole suite of Google tools that are free. Um, we'll touch on some of those in a second. Um, but it's actually just a quick, very quick sign up. You sign up with a Google account. You get a little embed code. A lot of your uh, CMS, your content management systems, have a very simple place where you actually just drop in this Google code. If not, you actually drop in that code in what you call your header. So any of your technical people who help build your website would know how to do that. All right. Now we're, we're in the stretch here, the final stretch, where we're just going to give you free tools that you can use. All right. So talk, talk about some of these, Petro, especially the speed one, because people can do that exactly. All the attendees here can do that to their website as soon as they get off and then figure out how important that is. Yeah, right. So all these links are here for you guys. So you'll actually have access to it. Um, the key part is, is that you want to understand, again, what your website looks like through the eyes of the browsers. This is really what we're talking about here in different areas, right? So the third one there, the speed page speed insights, it's gonna give you a view of how fast your website is loading both, both on mobile and on desktop. So you wanna make sure you check that out. When you're looking at it, you'll see on the left side of the screen there, there'll be a little tab that'll enable you to be able to kind of toggle between what mobile looks like versus desktop. Um, key part there is today, Google and all other search engines start on the mobile side, right? They actually search and grade your site mobile first. You wanna make sure that uh, score is high um, and it gives you a good grade on there. Uh, the mobile friendly will tell you how mobile friendly it is. Do you have objects that don't appear properly? Are they too large for the screen, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the things, um, quick little uh, insights on there. Uh, can, you, can you give, cause we're talking so much about content here and visual storytelling, images is so important, Petro. Can you tell us one very important tip about uploading images, like a format? Yeah, yeah, so, well. Which uh, impact one. your speed? Right, one, yeah, I could probably give you about 100, but the, the most important thing is the size of the image, right? You wanna make sure that the image is not too large. You wanna make sure it's large enough, right, to fit whatever um, a box or object you want it to do, right? If it's a banner on your website or if it's a small image um, within a, an article, um, et cetera. Uh, but you want to make sure that that image is not too large, right? And so what I mean by that is that when you take an image, even on your iPhone, purely on your iPhone, that image itself is most likely too large to just load on your website, right? It does need to be altered a bit to make sure that it fits properly. So the size of it is important. There are lots of other different things like uh, the actual type of file it is, right? Is it a JPEG? Is it a PNG file? Um, there are also a lots of new, what they call modern formats for, um, for images that are out there. So Again, you want to make sure you do your research and find out that the image ties best with your, your type of, of website you're building. Great. So uh, another tool that you guys can use when you're doing your keyword research is trends.google.com, trends.google.com. Obviously, as you know, everything about trends right now is all coronavirus, stock market, <laughs> and it's like doom and gloom. So, um, you know, every industry is going to be different now, but um, you can see here, you know, obviously the bachelor is very important, um, but you could choose for your location and your industry, uh, the topic here you put into trends.google.com and you start to see what the volume is. So it's a little bit different than the keyword planning tool in that that tool just gives you how many people are searching for that. 
uh, topic. And, and trends just, it, it's a great way to discover other topics within your industry or location. Uh, Google Search Console, why would this uh, tool be important, Petra? And we see so many websites, webmasters that don't use Google Search Console. Uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of reasons why, but uh, Google Search Console um, gives you again another. It's a free, another free platform, right? That allows you to sign up, add that to your website, um, and gives you so much more information, right? Whether it is the performance views, um, it allows you to see uh, go through your site map, right? We talked about site map, the importance of a site map. Uh, talks a little bit now about the added speed and mobile usability. Um, so it's going to give you some of those indicators that we talked about earlier that you could do on a link and find that information. Uh, Google Search Console kind of collects all that information and gives you a live view of how your website is doing. Or if you have, let's say, broken links, right? Yeah. Or you yeah. have a broken page. Let's say you, you went through this entire process and you created a super nice landing page with, with great content, video, and lo and behold, whoever uploaded put a no follow link onto that page. You would find out here because Google would say, hey, that page we have not indexed, meaning we're not going to show it to people when they search for it because there's a little thing called a, a do follow or no follow. And if the person uploading that information doesn't understand that, you may have done all that work and no right. one is ever going to find your content. So Google Search Console, free tool, easy to, to install. How about this one, Petra? This one is probably the easiest for local SEO. Yeah, and if you were at one of the last ones we did with Google, we had Matt from Google here. He was talking a lot about Google My Business. Um, Google My Business is a free tool, again, allows you to put a lot of information out there. It appears on the right side of your search as you're searching for something. It gives you a place to put pictures, images, you can post things. Um, there's actually, through Google My Business, a way to build a very simple one-page website um, that's free through Google um, and gives you that kind of pieces of information on there. Let's take it. I was going to show you a quick example here. Um, oh, so, oh, are we testing Plum Productions? If they We're have... testing Plum Productions. Let's see if their Google uh, is working. So you put the city because I'm not, I'm not in Boca right now. So I do have to put the city. And if on the right, there you go. That's their knowledge graph right there. Yeah. So you see there's a map to them. There's some images they posted on there. There's an address, hours, phone number. Again, this is free, right? This is free for you to get people know more about you. It's a place for reviews. Um, there's all kinds of other information you can add to it. Um, the key part is that people can actually contact you directly, right? We're finding more and more people are asking questions. They're chatting through Google My Business. Google My Business is an app both on Android and iOS that you can have up there. And it comes up like a notification. So you can actually just chat directly from your phone. Um, and tie back in that way. Great. All right. And what about this one, Petro? The site yes. audit we talked about earlier. Yeah, we touched on it earlier. We are giving you guys the ability to do a quick site audit. You can actually go to that website right there, predictmedia.com slash go slash website dash audit. Um, I'll actually copy and paste that and put that in the chat box really quick. All right. Awesome. Actually, Alex, Alex, you do that because I can't copy that. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, and um, that uh, that will allow you to go on there and you'll get a, we will send you guys a, a quick audit of the website and give you some really uh, just easy information to better understand what your digital presence is looking like currently. Oh no, I think I had uh, one more slide yeah, one more. here before I put that on there. Um, well, I can't see you right now, it's not sure. Right, yep. Um, right, so we'll op open it up to questions. You guys are not muted right now, so basically, Anyone can jump into conversation right now and, and, and we'll start to answer some questions. I don't have a question, but I sure want to thank you guys for uh, putting this on. This is really a great uh, deep dive kind of masterclass in web marketing. And I think you guys did a great job. Ah, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. That was a lot of wonderful information. Um, I do have a very quick question. And I was also the one that asked about nonprofits. So keep okay. in mind, that's the perspective I'm coming from. Um, in, in Google My Business, where it provides that information, like a little snippet when you first Google the location, mm -hmm. what if, for example, our centers have two campuses? Mm -hmm. How does that work without separating them and making them look like two separate entities? 
Yeah, so so Google My Business actually allows you to have multiple locations. It's actually in the, in the system itself. You have to just um, send that in there. What it does is just like your first one, it'll do. It'll actually just send out a little mailer to the actual address that you're saying is your secondary address. You just okay that it's there, and it'll come up as a secondary location within the Google Search Console. Now, Google is smart. Based on someone searching where they are geographically, it'll actually show them the one that's closer to them for the most part first, right? Especially if they're really far apart, right? Say you're in different counties or different cities. Um, it'll actually show the one that's closer um, as their first option. Um, but you can actually do that. You can do it for multiple locations. Um, and, and to add to that too, just a small little snippet, if you work at an, in an industry where you're uh, like a real estate agent or a lawyer, um, and you may be working in a specific area of business, um, you can actually also have your own Google My Business uh, and have the same location. Right, so both having multiple locations, Google My Business will show it. Um, and if you all work at one location, you can have multiple uh, people working at the same one. Um, and then, um, and then, if you have more questions about that, feel free to uh, email us. Emily, you can if we can help you with that. If you have any questions about Google My Business and how that works out. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions, guys? Um, Sophia, are you still there? I am. I'm here. Oh, great. Talk to us. <laughs> Was that, um, there are no more questions? Yeah, I don't think, I think, I think Ken wrote it. Thanks, Ken. We appreciate it. Yeah, it, it can be overwhelming to build a website and kind of launch that and, uh, and get into it. Um, but uh, you're, you're taking the right steps, getting out there, trying to find out the information and go through it. Um, again, we're always here as assets uh, for information. If you have anything, don't hesitate to email us. We're, we're here to answer questions um, even after this. And, and also, like, as far as feedback, right, uh, Sophia, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to always do these sessions, the, the tech committee we put on for one quarterly. If there's a topic that you guys want us to cover, and it's typically not us. Uh, I, actually, the speaker just fell through and threw out the <coughs> video. We can do it. But if there are topics that you guys want to cover um, within tech or marketing, um, please talk to Sophia and the team at the chamber. And um, we as a committee, like Ann and, and um, Mike Wolfson and Eric Soames and Jen <laughs> Yeager, we all will sit around and, and try to get the right content for you guys as members. Um, and just so everyone knows, this webinar is being recorded. So we're going to email this link out to everyone so you can reference back to. There you go. You'll have the recording and the slides. And their information as well. Yeah. Charlie I just, Alex's information. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, if no other questions, then thank you so much. Everybody stay safe and uh, look forward to seeing you around the community. Thank you. Everyone have a good day. Take Bye. care, everybody.